Good evening. My name is Ed Reed, and I am the program director here at Fair Count. Thank you so much for joining us on this lovely evening. Last May, Fair Count launched a Black Men Count uh, initiative to ensure that Black men are counted in the 2020 census. But with the most recent events in Minneapolis, Louisville, and even right here in Georgia, it's given a phrase, Black Men Count, a whole new meaning. While these events are recent, they are an indicative of a larger issue in our nation's history when discussing the killings of Breonna Taylor, Ahmaud Arbery, George Floyd, and others is an undeniable pattern. Today is a second episode of Undercounted Black Men Speak, where we'll have uh, put together a very uh, dynamic panel of, of youth from different areas of the country, particularly uh, Atlanta and Chicago. Uh, to talk about civic engagement at their age. Before we begin, I want to remind uh, everyone that uh, Fair Count is a nonpartisan, uh, nonprofit organization. As such, uh, we do not advocate for the defeat, election, or re election of any person from any political party. So now let's get started and turn to our esteemed guests of the evening. I've already had the opportunity to dialogue with a few of them, so I'm, I'm really excited for what they'll have to say tonight. Uh, today we have the founder of the Harvard Debate uh, Council Diversity Project, Mr. Black Brandon Fleming. Brandon, if you'll give a wave. We also have three alumni of the group, Xavier Schenkel, uh, Jordan Thomas, Ozaya al Khalik. Um, we also have Aiden Farmer, Eric Wilson from the Common Ground Foundation in Chicago, Illinois. So thank you gentlemen for joining us. I know this will be a dynamic uh, discussion. Uh, so with that, I wanna go ahead and turn to our first question. Uh, for our first question, we want to hear from the students about what this shift has been uh, like, you know, particularly talking about the pandemic being quarantined for a number of months now. You know, in less than five months, we have had our lives completely shift um, from COVID-19 to the protests against police brutality nationwide. How are you processing uh, these events and how does it make you feel internally? I want to start with uh, Xavier, then we'll go to Jordan, uh, Ozaya, uh, Aiden, and then in with Eric. All right, so first off, uh, thank you, Mr. Reed, for inviting uh, you know, me and my peers on to speak tonight. I think it's amazing that you, know, you have a platform for youth to speak and that you're granting us this opportunity. Um, and in terms of your question, you know, the last five months have definitely been a whirlwind. Um, and I think the best anecdote to put in, or the best way to phrase it is, um, and I've told this story before, uh, when I started my senior year of high school, I felt like I was a king. I felt like I was on top of the world. I had a really high grades, I had good test scores, you know, everything in my life was going fine. And sort of in my school community, I was sort of like, sort of like this, this perfect idolized figure. And one day I was walking down the hallway and I felt a tap on my shoulder from my science teacher. He looks me in the eyes and he says, Xavier, what is your purpose? And so here I am, this person in the world who thinks he's got it all figured out, ready to go to college, got good grades, got scholarships lined up, and someone came to me and they challenged me and they asked me what was my purpose. And it was like, I was all the way on top of the world and one little thing brought me down to the ground. And I think when we talk about what's happened over the past five months, a lot of us were in a space where we weren't, where we felt like everything was okay. Where we felt like we were moving forward. We felt like our life was about to peak where everything was lining up. Everything was coming in the perfect position. And then coronavirus knocked on our doors and it knocked us all the way down. And then we've seen the recent happenings with the murder of George Floyd. And so when I, talk, when I think about what this means to me and how I process it, I see it simply as an awakening in that it's a message to, to, to the, the, the health community, to the social justice community, to almost every community in America or even in the world, that no matter what you're doing, no matter where you are, no matter how successful you are, no matter how strong you are, it all can go away in a snap of a finger. It can all go away at the drop of a dime. And when we talk about, okay, it's a rude awakening the past five months, what does that mean on an individual scale? Well, I bring you back to what my science teacher said to me at the beginning of the year. And he said, Xavier, what is your purpose? And so I think that when we come to times like this and, and how we navigated it, especially how we navigate it, especially as African-American males, I think it's important for us to always remember as we go through tumultuous times like this, to never forget why we wake up every day, to never forget our purpose. Because we've seen that no matter how many, you know, how many times we could dress up in a suit or how many speeches we can give or how much money is in our bank account, our social status can go away in the drop of a dime. And so the past five months have taught me that no matter who I am or who I think I've become, I've got to stay true to my purpose and my why. 
because things will come like the coronavirus and the recent protests that can sort of sidetrack our mission in the world. And I think it's up to us as humans to be able to not only adapt, but push through the challenges that the world faces us or the world challenges us with. Thank you, Jordan. Uh, again, I'd like to concur with uh, Xavier. I really want to thank you for having us on and uh, you letting us use your platform to spread our message, our individual message and collective message. Because in times like these, it's, it's imperative that we have platforms like these to educate and, and bring awareness uh, to individual views and uh, our life experiences. And that's what uh, platforms like these allow us to spread. Um, but when I think about these last five months, I think of the quote, and all of us have heard it before, that tough times don't last, yet tough people do. Um, and, and I bring that up to say, because these last five months have shown us, like Xavier said, anything can happen at the drop of a dime that could ruin whatever plans that we had going on, whatever career path that we thought we had, whatever uh, agenda that we thought would be our life goals. It could all be gone in an instant. So of course, you know, it's, it's one thing to accept all that's happened and, you know, and sulk and self-pity about what we're going through. But it's another thing to pick yourselves up and navigate and know how to move past this. And, and the question that I've asked myself is, how can I come out of this better than when I started? Uh, a lot of my peers in, uh, in, my high school, in my college and high school at that, uh, you know, they, they've had ways and paths provided for them. To, to come out better, whether it be internships lined up or, or networking uh, circles that are already aligned for them. I know I don't have that. So let me use this time now and this freedom now that I have to create that. So that happens in uh, multiple ways. First, applying for new internships, you know, exploring what I can do. Obviously, uh, with the quarantine going on and us being stuck inside, you know, it makes it a little bit harder but what about remote internships? You know, what can I look to in my specific career path that I want, that I can do online, uh, that I have more access to now because COVID is keeping us inside? Also creating a detailed career path. Uh, I came into college uh, on an undecided major, but now I've had more time to think of what I want to do and how I need to get there and what steps I need to take. You know, I'm fortunate enough to only be a, fr a former freshman in college. So, you know, I'm starting at an early stage comparatively speaking, do I have the freedom to be able to decide where I want to go? So it, it is an obligation that I have to use this time to determine where I want to go and you know, cut that path out. Also establishing groups to create generational wealth. You know, how can, I, how can I use my time and my research to not only generate wealth for myself, but also create wealth for my kids and my children's children? You know, it, it's never too early to start saving all right, you know, well, now that I have all the time in the world, let me look at how to invest or how to save, you know, how to use the markets to my advantage. Let me, I, I'm tired of reading news stories about uh, people like Warren Buffett or Bill Ackman and Jeff Bezos profiting from the markets. Instead of reading about that, let me be in that circle as well. So doing research in that aspect and, and figuring out how to profit and create generational wealth, that's something that I've also uh, taken into account and in how I've processed this time. Of course, you know, you know, it's it's it makes me feel bad, you know, missing out on things like spring break, or you know, losing time with uh, new friends that I made, and you know, this being the beginning of my college career. But in the back of my mind, I know that there's a much bigger plan at work, and I know that this is the time to create and execute in that much bigger plan. So again, I, I want to thank you for inviting us on. Yeah, that, that's that's how I felt these last few months. You know, let me create a plan of action to be better than I was when I came in here. And this is the perfect time to execute. Awesome, thank you, Mr. Ackley. Yeah, good evening, um, Mr. Reed. I'd like to um, thank you and Fair Count for just allowing us this platform to be able to speak and be able to just be able to um, say our opinions and provide constructive conversation because this platform is important and it's important to especially have black men to be able to speak on subjects like this. Um, for me, this is the first time I've ever been able to see my community and peers this civically engaged um, since I want to say March on Our Lives. Um, as um, a leader um, in, in my community, a lot of uh, the conversations I, I have 
um, with my peers and um, with adults are how do we make people care? How do we make people care about the world? How do we make people care about service? How do we make people care about giving? And so it's, it's, it's a tough question um, for us to ask because we're essentially asking how are we able to move people's hearts? And I think this is the precise moment in which we're able to see a movement where people are being able to be vulnerable and, and put their hearts first. This, this, is, this, is, this is about a, a time of protest because of police brutality, but this is also a time for us to come together as a community and come together to mourn and to talk about something that's, that's bigger than each and every one of us. And to be able to see us all convene in such a manner and, and hold such a vulnerable position where it's not about anything else but each other and God is, is really powerful. And so I think this is a testament to not only um, our will as leaders and humans, but also our capacity to love each other and capacity to come together. Um, as a college student, even though I'm um, continuing um, a lot of my education and summer plans online, um, a lot of social organizations and a lot of um, student clubs have been reaching out um, online just to have town halls, to have discussions, to have podcasts, to host um, informal chats. And so I, I think this is a true testament to, for, to embody um, for the first time people being able to step outside of themselves and to do something that has never really been required of, of them before to this extent. And I, I, I think it's powerful. For me, this, this movement makes me aware. It makes me aware of, of not only my position in the world, but it also makes me aware of the impact that I can have on others and on my community, uh, and on my community as well. Um, I echo um, uh, Jordan's sentiment in, in talking about how can we come out of this situation better? What can we improve on? Um, and so a, a, a lot of the perspective that I like to take with um, situations that bring about a lot of um, grief and, and pain is about how we can ignite that to action. How can we not only make this about healing and catharsis, but how can we also make this about impact? And so I think that's the next step for um, our community in general. And um, I think a lot of uh, what we're seeing right now is indicative of what the future holds. Um, I, I, I see the youth um, not only shaping the world in, in, in their own vision, but also being able to come together and, and, and unify um, different communities together to be able to advocate for, for something. Um, and I, I think we'll be able to see more of that in the future. And I look forward to the role each and every one of us um, plays in doing that, no matter if it's a small role or it's a big role. And I think um, definitely having um, organizations like uh, Fair Fight and having uh, platforms such as these to convene um, different um, youths and perspectives together is an important role to play in, in transforming that vision. Thank you so much. I'm gonna turn now to Mr. Farmer. All right, thank you. Um, again, I wanna echo everyone else's sentiment in saying that I think it is, again, very important that we have, you know, some sort of forum and a way to get our own thoughts out there. Um, for me, prior to this whole situation, I was in kind of a weird place in my life. Um, I'm a freshman in high school, and for all intents and purposes, I'm not supposed to know where I'm going, what I'm doing. You know, it's very much a time for me to figure things out. Um, I'm an athlete. I was getting ready to go into my first um, season as a varsity lacrosse player. Um, I'm, you know, still figuring a lot of things out for, you know, so this time has really allowed me to think more. Um, it's just given me the time to think about, you know, the world around me, how I learn, how I sleep, just different things about myself, figuring those things out. Um, because with the hustle and bustle of my regular life, I wasn't able to do that. So giving this kind of as a time out, that's how I kind of think about it as a time out, just a time for me to say, hey, let me think about myself or just how I you know, process that that goes around me and to make myself a better person as well. You know, I, I've said it multiple times to multiple people that this entire time, the time that I'm sitting 
doing whatever I'm doing, I want to come out of this as a better, better person, as Jordan said. So I want to come out of it as, you know, better in all aspects of my life. That's been my goal throughout the entirety of it. So, you know, keeping myself up to date on the current events, um, you know, being active or just, you know, not isolating myself, not limiting myself in this time, just allowing myself to be a little bit more free and, you know, think about the things that I'm doing from a day to day basis. Just learning more during this entire time is what's really been important to me. Awesome. Thank you for the insight. Um, Mr. Wilson, if you'll close us out for question number one. Hey, how you doing, uh, everybody? Um, I just want to say that it's important to have a, a platform like this and for us to be able to communicate uh, with each other effectively because that's the only time real, real change come about. For the last five months, I want to say that um, the experience of this is just saying that uh, in life, there's always going to be a new experience. For me, um, I'm in my senior year of college uh, at Clark Atlanta University. I was, uh, I was at a point where people feel like I was supposed to know exactly where I was supposed to go post-graduation. And um, with this pandemic and with coronavirus being real, it just shows that in life, there's always going to be new experiences. Whether you're black or white, it's always going to be something new where you have to adapt, you have to overcome. And um, in these moments, that's where true leaders are made. Um, there's going to be winners and losers of every situation. Now, when it comes to George Floyd and police brutality, um, that's, that shift was, uh, was uh, I, I want to say it was a wake-up call because uh, in America, everybody know that, you know, we're, everybody knows the history. When it comes down to it, uh, Blacks, we've been, you know, put in several positions of uncom of being uncomfortable. And um, in this time, this is only a preview of something that the people before us had to go through. Our ancestors didn't have the same level of comfort that many of us live with today. And I look at myself, I'm African-American, I'm 22 years old. I was the one back in the day who would be on the front line fighting for our people, fighting for the kids, fighting for the grandkids, whether it was mentally or physically, being on those front lines, being able to educate people about things that's going on, being able to also assist and serve. And um, speaking to um, uh, Mr. Khalid, Khalid, who uh, spoke, you know, amazingly about how uh, being a pillar in your own community is important. I just want to go a step forward, further and say to everybody in the world, if you're not part of the uh, solution, you're a part of the problem. Um, and there's so many people that's in, you know, communities worldwide who, uh, you know, feel a certain type of way. And I, I want to say in the last five months, seeing how, you know, people have united behind Black Lives Matter. I want to say that, you know, yeah, before this, I did feel hopeless in America. Yeah, before this, I did feel like it was always a target on my back just because of the skin that I wear every single day. But, you know, looking at the different messages and seeing, you know, Black women rally behind Black men and seeing how our people are, are able to organize, mobilize, and, and utilize, you know, everything that we have to offer. Um, and, and, you know, I just took this time to educate myself on my history some more. Um, yeah, I know how Jim Crow was real. Um, yeah, I know, I'm sorry. Yeah, I know how Jim Crow was real. Yeah, I know how a lot of stuff uh, that happened in history, you know, uh, has, you know, happened in, you know, negatively affected the black culture and the black community. But, you know, this year, 2020, going down in the history books, I feel like, you know, it's amazing that, you know, I'm still breathing, that I'm able to, you know, witness this. But also, you know, me as a mass communication major at Clark Atlanta, once again, I feel like it's my initiative to help write history the way that it should be written. I feel like this is an important time for us to, you know, act behind what we know and what we see on a daily basis and, and put our own words with the actual pictures of things that is happening today. I feel like this is a significant time in history. This is something that's going to be talked about forever. And, you know, I'm blessed to be here, but I also know that I'm here for that purpose. Speaking to, um, speaking to uh, Xavier, who spoke earlier about finding that purpose, I feel like these last five months, I was able to find my purpose and I was able to, you know, help bring things to the light. And, and just, you know, speaking back to, you know, this amazing platform where people are able to speak their mind, I feel like this is a testimony to um, Ed Reed's, you know, purpose on how he's able to, you know, bring people together and bring people together to speak on positive things that's going on. 
Thank you so much, gentlemen. Uh, thank you, Mr. Wilson, for that. Uh, I, you know, I feel like we've had a really robust discussion there, even just in question number one. So I just can't wait to, <laughs> to get to the other questions uh, that we have tonight. Um, the next one, I want to now shift to Brandon, uh, Mr. Fleming, who's, who's also joining us tonight. Um, and he is a member of our Black Men uh, Complete Count Committee. So Black Men Count, uh, we really appreciate you joining us tonight. But with your program, the Harvard Debate Council Diversity Project, uh, you have young men attend the weekly program in Atlanta for 10 months that culminates into a summer residency at Harvard College, um, where young men debate other scholars. How do you see that fitting into the current conversation about cultivating civic engagement at a very young age? Uh, how has engaging young people in the dialogue and conversation about world issues impacted their civic engagement in the long term? First of all, again, like everyone's already mentioned, Ed, my brother, thank you so much for, for doing what you always do, and, and that is bringing people together. Um, this is such a critical and important time for us to be able to engage with one another. Um, and it's such a, a beautiful opportunity to, to see these young black men, you know, who, who are leading the charge and, and this revolution um, in the same way that young people have done historically. And that's what's so critically important about what we see. Um, when we talk about civic engagement, here's what we have to understand. Discourse and debate is central to democracy. So when we talk about social progress, when we talk about reform, when we talk about change in general, that does not happen absent of discourse and debate. That's what makes this democracy what it is. That is what gives us the opportunity to hold people accountable and to speak truth to power and to balance power in this society. And the thought that we can wield weapons, excuse me, that we can wield words like weapons to defend the vulnerable is precisely what this educational process is all about teaching kids how to think critically, teaching kids how to communicate effectively, but most of all, teaching them how to find their voices, how to find themselves, and how to use those voices to uh, enact change in society. That is what it's all about, and that is precisely the, the role of, of civic engagement. Um, we have to be able to, to look at worldviews and analyze them, and that's where it begins. It begins, by not teaching kids what to think, but teaching them how to think, by introducing them to a myriad of worldviews so that they may find their own and appreciate the worldview of others. When we create that experience, that is how we are able to build something like empathetic enterprise, which means that we are building businesses and institutions that serve people and not exploit people. But all of that begins with a conversation. And the conversation is, it doesn't matter if it's enterprise, it doesn't matter if it's education. We must value humanitas, which always keeps humans at the center. And that is the central axis upon which our society has to turn. Thank you, thank you so much. You might see me even writing, I'm writing tidbits over here. So much profound uh, words coming out and, uh, and I just wanna make sure we don't lose that in, in today's conversation. I'm gonna go now uh, with question number three. I'm gonna go to Xavier and Eric uh, with this question. Um, on the first night of the curfew that was instituted here in Atlanta, um, a video of a Spellman and Morehouse student being forcibly removed from their vehicle and tased quickly made the rounds on social media, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram. Uh, there were also major protests on the Magnificent Mile in Chicago, a major area for tourism and retail. Our students today come to us from Chicago and Atlanta, respectively, both of which have a rich Black history. Chicago was home to the first Black president, uh, and Atlanta has been called the Black Mecca. They have also been hot spots in recent protests against police brutality. How do we put those in this particular conversation? What does it look like to keep striving for justice in a place that seems like it is so far ahead of other places in America. First, I want to go to uh, Xavier. That's, a, that's an excellent question. And I think that when we talk about what Atlanta represents, and you, you mentioned earlier, it's been referred to as the Black Mecca for so long. And that is, it's so rich in African-American history and so many monumental things 
have occurred in this city. And I think that when we talk about if we're ahead or not, I wouldn't necessarily always say that we're ahead. I would say that we're always the example. Or we're always the the sort of sort of the city upon a hill that a lot of movements and a lot of organizations look to when they talk about what it means to create success in the African American community. Um, and that to me, that means two things. That means as a city, we have a responsibility to do certain things, and we also have to set the bar high. And so first I want to talk about this notion of our responsibility as a city. And I don't mean sort of responsibility as certain tasks we have to complete every day. I mean the word responsibility. We have the ability to respond to certain situations and certain happenings in our society um, that we need to take. And so when we talk about you know, injustice happening across, across the nation, a lot of people are saying, well, why are they protesting in Atlanta if there was no major you know, happening or occurrence there? Why are they protesting in Atlanta if, if, if there was no, no if, if nothing happened? And I, I look back to that word of responsibility. We have the platform, we have the people, we have the resources necessary to respond to certain situations and to make a statement to our society and to our country um, on behalf of the African American community. And that sort of whatever we do, a lot of other organizations, a lot of other cities are going to model. And then that leads me into the second point. And that point relates to sort of setting the bar high. And so when we talk about, you know, protests and, and, and uh, protests against police brutality, you know, whether it be setting a curfew, all these different things. I think that as a city, or as a leader rather, when we talk about being a leader, a leader has to make lots of sacrifices in order to do, uh, in order to serve his, his people best. And so as a city, I think for us, it means we have to make a lot of sacrifices. We have to make a lot of tough decisions in order to serve our people best, in order to set the best example, in order to set the highest bar for the rest of the, for the, rest of the entire country. And so that means sometimes we may have to protest. Sometimes we may have to, you know, act out in certain different ways. Sometimes, you know, our, our mayor, we, need, we may need to have a vocal mayor. Sometimes our mayor may need to bring celebrities um, um, onto the news at night because everything we do, I mean, it sort of sets the standard for everyone else. And I feel like when we talk about Atlanta, Black Mecca, you know, I talked about our ability to respond. When it comes to setting the bar high, we have to use every resource that we have available um, in order to make a statement in order to speak out against all the injustices happening in our community. Because what we don't want to happen is for, you know, I said earlier, I said Atlanta, we, we're seen as a head, but really just the example. Because there, there truly are people, resources, and organizations that are, that are powerful enough to make change in almost every city in America. Of course, you know, that, you know, that, that, that statement, you know, um, that notion, that idea varies, you know, city by city. But I can assure you there's somebody out there who's looking to make change in individual city. And the last thing that we want is for someone to look at Atlanta and look at the plethora of resources that we have, the plethora of, 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 of amazing African-American people, and for us not to act. Because that sends a message to someone else with less resources that they don't have to act. But that is, that, that is not their responsibility. And that's why I think that we have to set the bar high and always use our resources to the best of our ability so that we send the message throughout the rest of the nation, throughout the rest of the world even, that no matter what resources you have, no matter where you are right now, it's always your responsibility to speak out um, in, in order to make a statement um, about what's going on in the world. And so that, that's, that's sort of the, 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 my perception um, about Atlanta and the role Atlanta plays in this community or in this entire happening, and that we have to set the bar high and we have to show people what it's like when you use your resources. Thank you. Turning now to Mr. Wilson. Hey, I, I just wanted to, um, you to repeat the last part of that question one more time, just so I can give you like a full answer. Yeah, absolutely. So how do we, so, you know, they have been hotspots, you know, particularly thinking about Atlanta and Chicago being hotspots for protests against police brutality in the more recent days and weeks. But how do we put those in conversation? You know, how does it look like to keep striving for justice uh, in a place mm -hmm. that seems like it's so far ahead um, of other places in America? And when we're talking about other places, we're talking you know, specifically about you know Chicago and Atlanta being so far mm -hmm. ahead, um, but still struggling with the justice piece right now. Yeah, so um, just speaking on that, uh, I know that uh, the introduction to that question I actually spoke on one of my close friends, Messiah, who was one of the people that was pulled out of uh, the car on uh, CNN Worldwide. And um, I just want to say for the record, for me, um, seeing my close friend, my fellow Kenwood alumni, seeing, uh, you know, the Clark Atlanta Morehouse connection is there, seeing him pull out the car told me that, you know, it, it just needs to be an immediate change. And seeing that in Atlanta, a place where uh, there are so many black politicians, so 
a place where there is so many people that that I'm talking about a place where there is you know uh black ceos black presidents black millionaires seeing that on on worldwide it almost se seems like it was sending a message it almost seemed like you know it was a message that you know it doesn't matter you know where you are you know it can happen to you and i felt like you know i could be in those exact same shoes and just putting that into perspective um you know with chicago and atlanta kind of being the forefronts of, uh, you know, some of the, you know, organizations kind of being, you know, the platform, kind of also being uh, the headquarters for so many organ organizations that fight for us. I feel like it was almost necessary for, you know, Killer Mike to go on CNN. It was almost necessary for so many things to happen. Uh, the same with, um, you know, people rallying in Chicago in those protests, marching down the Magnificent Mall. There's so many places that are significant to us as people. And I feel like we have to, you know, take control of the situation. Uh, and speaking of that, when I was actually a part of some of those protests and seeing firsthand, you know, arm and arm people that actually want change, I feel like it was powerful because there are strength in numbers and strength in structure and strength in organization. And Chicago and Atlanta is two places that have all of the tools to make the change. It seemed like we're just waiting on it. We have all of the tools to go out and, you know, make budget cuts, uh, re reallocate the budget. Um, there's so many um, people that have power. I'm talking about uh, Lori Lightfoot in Chicago, as well as Mayor Keisha Bottoms. We have people, black men and women, that are in these powerful positions where 50 years ago, that was the goal. 50 years ago, it was the goal to get people in position to make change. Now, you know, looking back 50, 50 years later from this point, where we at right now, 2020. So think about 2070. I want to see what, we, what we're talking about today, you know, be effective in a result because we know what change looks like. We know what change, uh, we know when change is happening. We know what, what, it, what feels right to us, just like, you know, every other American, you know, of age or with sense know what's right or wrong. We know what side we stand on. So I feel like, you know, Chicago, also New York and California have not certain resources because we know that's the only thing that separate us we know that resources is the only thing that separate us having books in our schools having you know the right education for cops having you know real training those is the only things that is separating us as a people or or really you know uh that that's that where racism come into effect where where you can really get oppressed where you really have a pressure the only thing that is separating is resources and we have the resources right now and I feel like, especially in Chicago, we will make the steps to make those changes because I know some of those people personally that is, you know, dedicated their lives and dedicated their time to this change. And, you know, I'm, I know I'm a person where I'm, a, I'm coming up in the world. I know that what's right and right and what's wrong is wrong. And I know that I will also go out on a limb and go out on a reach for anybody as, as far as policies go or as far as individuality. And, I, and that's, that's just it. Thank you, gentlemen. We appreciate that. We're going to um, head into question number four now. Um, we're going to start with uh, Mr. Alkalik and then go to Mr. Thomas. But the question number four, we're seeing an outcry from our youth for change in the world. You know, they want to grow up in uh, as you dream of a brighter future. What do you see? And some of you have touched on this briefly already. But, you know, as you dream of a brighter future, what are you seeing? You know, you've had some time maybe now during the pandemic to, to think about, you know, your future. What do you see as an avenue to achieve your goals as an individual and your goals for society as a whole? Mr. Reed, that's a beautiful question. Um, when I dream for a brighter future, the, the first thing I see is empathetic leadership. For the first time in a long time, I, I feel as though nationally and internationally in, in terms of response, in terms of agency, we are all on the same page. You know, um, I, I cry and, and, and feel the pain of my brothers and sisters in um, Minnesota. I actually um, have family there as well. And um, when, 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 I, when I see um, the videos of protests and, and, and I hear um, the activists speaking and, and I, I feel their pain and I see their tears. And when we leave with our hearts first, there's nothing that separates us because we all know pain and we, and we all know, know what that feels like. And so I, I feel like that's that's critically important when, when we're talking about what it takes in order for us to unify and in terms of what it what it means for for us to heal and what it means for us to move forward with that unification. And so I see empathetic leadership pay, uh, playing a, a major role. And um, alongside that, I, I see community and solidarity. 
as well, regardless of um, what dis disposition we're in or what um, backgrounds we come from. Um, and I also see artistry. You know, um, I, I, I had the chance to um, uh, do a lot of research in terms of like how people are expressing themselves. We're, we're seeing an age where, where predominantly a lot of the youth are, are getting up and they're writing poetry. They're doing spoken word, they're singing songs. Um, they're expressing themselves. And um, as, as I understand it, the, the, the purpose of artistry itself is, is not to conclude. It's, it's not based off logic. The purpose of artistry and expression is to convey. And so I, I think when we're able to, to, to feel what other people are feeling and use that in order to drive not, not, not only our courage, but to drive our, um, our willingness to, to still move in spite of fear, I think that's important because it, it takes a lot of vulnerability and it takes a lot of courage to be able to to drop down your barriers get in front of the crowd and, and express your pain to other people and um, I, don't, I don't think that's something that should be overlooked and so I think artistry empathetic leadership and, and community are, are, are pivotal for us to not only unify together but to all for, for all of us to be on the same page in order for us to sit down and have these discussions as um, Mr. Fleming has um, reiterated earlier in terms of what I see as the avenue for achieving these goals on an individual standpoint. Um, Mr. Fleming has always taught us within the Harvard Debate Council Diversity Project that we, that we have an obligation, a moral obligation, to build as we climb. We have an obligation to, to serve the less fortunate, especially if we are operating from a stance of privilege. Not everybody is afforded the opportunities that we are able to be given through the Harvard Debate Council Diversity Project, and it's important that we give back. It's important that, that, that we understand where we come from and provide seeds of nourishment and growth in order to make sure that our communities are flourishing just as we are. And so I, I, I think as an individual and as a leader, that is the next step for making sure that I am able to impact my community, making sure that I'm creating an impact where I'm able to serve, I'm able to effectively respond, but also make sure that I'm able to understand understand people's plights, understand where people come from, because that's also important too. Um, in terms of um, what I think the goal needs to be for society as a whole, I, I, I think in terms of when we understand um, unity, I think it's important to understand for the youth specifically that they're not alone. This is an unprecedented time where we're having a lot of organizations show support, we're, we're having a lot of um, international support for the movement as well. And we're also having a, a lot of support from, from our leaders. Even looking at um, Atlanta, for example, when we're having Killer Mike or um, T.I. or when Keisha Lance Bottoms, our mayor, um, brings um, pastors to speak. Um, and and, and it's, it's important to understand that, that it's not only the youth that stands alone, we, we have solidarity with, um, our parents and their parents' parents as well. And, and they are with us and asking, what can we do to help? And what can we do to move forward? And I think that they have a wisdom and experience as um, Mr. Wilson pointed out before, that is critical for, for understanding not only how, do we, how we survive, but how we move past. And understanding that this is not the end, but the beginning of, 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 of something greater than what, what we've seen before. So I think understanding um, as, as, as a whole, socially, utilizing our leadership and, and, and utilizing those who came before us who have walked upon the same path, but have been able to walk upon that path stronger than when they left is, 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 is really important in terms of understanding how we can utilize agency from all demographics in terms of um, meeting that better future and that dream that we all have. Thank you. Uh, we're going to turn now to Mr. Thomas. Um, when, when I envision what society's future looks like, my answer is it both defines the goal of where society wants to be and the means of getting there. And I'll explain what I mean. At the end of the day, I see a future of revolution. Uh, this is an unprecedented time where Whatever was hidden in the shadows, it will and has, it has and will come to light. 
uh, primarily because we've never seen so much conviction uh, when it comes to protesting and so much momentum. I mean, every, like every single state in the United States, plus international support, has come out for the Black Lives Matter movement. That's unprecedented. That we've never seen that in our, in our nation's history before. So this, this is a future of revolution. On top of that, you have the impact of social media and technology where you can spread information, you know, like that. It, it, it's, 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 it's crazy to think about, you know, how, how much, you know, a movement, how much power a movement has. And that's what I see in our future, you know. We, we've gone from a point in time where, you know, everything's word of mouth or like you may have seen it over radio or over television to where everything you know, goes through uh, a Twitter upload, you know, a, a hashtag going viral. So I see, a, I see a real future of revolution here. Nothing, nothing can happen that cannot be exposed and will not be exposed. You, know, you, you can't do anything and be slick anymore. You know? Everything does come to the light. Um, I also, uh, I, I see a buildup of a moral awakening as well. You know, um, you can almost relate it to like a, a great awakening, or a social revolution outside of just the Black Lives Matter movement or the Me Too movement or movements for uh, pro-gay rights and things like that. We have a whole moral shift in our society of inclusivity that we've never seen before. And, and, and it goes so deep to where the people are calling out the United States government to its core, and we've never seen a response like we have. I'll explain what I mean. When we have uh, an administration that calls on its own military to quell the, the protests and the riots of the people who are calling that uh, government out, that's when you know that we've struck a chord so deep that we've never seen before. So, I see a future of revolution, but the means of getting there is the revolution that we have already. Uh, for myself personally, uh, my future, it, it looks like, uh, or what I would envision it, is to work with the United States government uh, with contracting and lobbying as well, using a, a platform that I have to influence policy. Specifically, I've taken an interest to the United States foreign policy and uh, that, that's just where my core of study is. And, uh, I'm declaring my major in political science and international studies, but how do I envision myself getting there? And it, it starts out with simple things. Uh, and it's quite comical, but simply creating like a LinkedIn page, you know, you know taking those steps to become more professional. Um, I, I know that's a, uh, contra uh, it's, it's a controversial term in and of itself, but you know, taking that step, I've, I'm 19 years old now. I'm, I'm not a kid anymore. You know, I, I don't have that excuse of being the young, bright high school mind. And I don't have the, oh, you have such a bright future. Now, this is the time where I create my future. So taking those initial first steps and uh, in the right direction to set up a brighter future, that's what I'm doing now. Uh, on top of that, establishing new relationships relentlessly. You know, never settle for the social circle that I have now because it, it can always be better. Uh, another reason why I want to thank you for inviting, here, uh, inviting me here is now I have two or three new brothers that I can add to my social circle that we can build for each other. So I hope this relationship lasts longer than this, than just this Facebook Live, you know what I mean? Because now we have each other in our network. So that included also like how we were talking about before, you know, uh, I think it was Mr. Farmer that said earlier that this is a real time out. It's a real time to read too. You know, get back to the simple things. Uh, whether it's reading philosophy books, understanding new ways of thought, uh, whether it's current events about things that we see outside of just the headlines. Because although the Black Lives Matter movement, like no one's going to doubt, it is the headline and deservedly so. You know, there's a whole world of events that's happening right now and things that you know, we may not see on the, on the headline of CNN or Fox News, MSNBC or ABC, but there's a whole world of events going on right now. So paying attention to the little things as well and seeing how they work in the greater uh, woodwork that we know as the globe. Uh, and also just understanding the playing field. Obviously, I know I'm just one, one person, one young adult. And you know, I, I have my idea of where I want to be in life and things like that. But I, I can't get there if I don't know how to get there. Um, a friend of mine, Levi, uh, Levi Lester from, from uh, school, 
he told me that life is like everyone in a, in a room blindfolded with the lights off trying to find the light switch. Now, other people may have people telling them directions on how to get to the light switch, but at the end of the day, we, we, we don't know what we're doing. What, what we're doing. Uh, at this point, I'm trying, to, I'm trying to create a map of my room, you know, seeing where I need to go to reach the goal that I want to reach. So, I mean, uh, again, that comes with reading and, you know, uh, educating myself on where I want to be and how I want to get there. And uh, on top of that as well, just becoming more well-rounded well as a person. You know what I mean? Like, I can study whatever I want to study. But, you know, pick up, pick up a new hobby. Pick up a new skill. Learn an instrument, you know? Uh, read, read about random facts on the internet and things like that. Just random quirky things. You know, it, it may seem uh, inconsequential at first while you're doing it. At the end of the day, it pays off. You know, talk to, talk to people that are studying different things than you. Uh, learn about what they're learning about. You know, maybe pick up a few facts here and there from them. Um, because being well-rounded is, my mom's told me since day one, since I was two years old, uh, being well, a well-rounded person is it's the best thing that you can do to have the strongest social network. So becoming more well-rounded of a person, that's my, uh, that's my personal thing that I want to improve upon. Um, and what I see my future looking like. And that's, that's where I want to be in my future. Thank you. There's so much I wish I could expound upon, follow up on, you know, based on this dialogue, but I want to make sure we get all of our, you know, our questions in. It's one thing that, you know, you just said, I think that really resonates and that's, you know, the ability to build relationships. And we mentioned that, you know, some of our panelists are from Chicago or from Atlanta, two different groups, but, you know, being able to connect, you know, whether it be email or text, even after this event over, I think that's powerful. You know, our ability to continue to do that and expand our, our networks is, is really, is really a powerful thing. Our next question uh, is going to go to uh, Mr. Uh, Fleming and Mr. Farmer. Uh, one of the narratives that is often told about our youth is that they are selfish. You know, they don't care about the world around them. Um, but as we watch youth around the world lead the, cha the charge for change, we can see that that is not the case. Um, you know, Mr. Fleming, as someone who works with our youth every day, what do you think are some of the ways uh, as a culture we underestimate our youth, particularly in regards to their understanding of the world around them? Yeah, you know, th this is a great one and, and a very important one, because here's what I need you to understand and what I need everybody to understand. There is a fallacious stigma that stains the integrity of young people, uh, millennials in particular, and, and that is that they are unable and unwilling. But it's not a matter of whether young people are interested. It's a matter of whether older people are able to engage them. What happens is older people tend to use this as a scapegoat um, to, to shift the blame from, from, from older people to younger people and, and asserting um, that there's a, a, a lack of interest when there's not, there's a lack of engagement. And, and that is our responsibility. Something very powerful um, happens when zeal and wisdom coalesce, when there's a marriage of experiential relevance and cultural competence. And that's what happens when young people and older people come together at the table. Um, we experience that level of power. But, but we have to understand that they have something um, that, that, you know, we don't really have, and and I'm speaking, you know, of course, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty young, you know, I'm a millennial myself, but these brothers are younger than me, you know, and even they have something that, that you and I don't have, Ed, and, and that is zeal, energy, you know, um, I'm going to share something as, as long as, as you and the people on Facebook don't judge me. Um, so the other day, brother, I went out to those protests, right, and I was out there on the band, and man, I was on, I was on the front line, brother, giving it everything that I had. I mean, yelling, screaming, holding up my sign and all that, um, get, giving it everything. And then, man, listen, 30 minutes in, I got tired, brother. <laughs> I was exhausted. Really? I, you know, I was exhausted. And I'm looking at them, you know, young people going, man, just giving it everything. And I'm like, listen, I see the people over there passing out water and pizza. I'm like, okay, you know, let me, let me go help with, with them over there. And so, you know, I stayed out there because I was thinking about the fact that, man, you know, brothers like MLK was out there, man, in the, in the scorching heat, 
you know, in three piece suits, you know, for hours and hours. And so, you know, I was able to push through and I stayed out there for a while and you know, I live in Centennial Parks. So and then after that, I went back up to my apartment and I was cheering them on from my balcony. Uh, but nonetheless, you know, um, I admire their, their resilience. Um, I, I admire their, their tenacity. Um, and, and we have to understand that, that they have the ability to engage other young people in a way that we simply do not. One of the most powerful things I've ever seen is um, within our organization is that, that our young people actually lead workshops. Now, I don't teach those workshops. Our students teach those workshops. So we have the Harvard curriculum and they take that Harvard curriculum. What I teach them in class, they give it to other young people in the city. And you will see if you come to one of those community workshops, hundreds of young people wrapped around the building waiting to get in, not to be taught by me, but to be taught by them. And you know what I do? I move out of the way. That's our responsibility, Ed. We give them what we're supposed to give them and we move out of the way. One of the things that I tell my kids all the time, I look them in the eyes and I tell them, if you need me by the end of this program, I did not do my job. I know I've done my job as an educator when you no longer need me because the role of an educator is not to feed you for the rest of your life, but to teach you how to feed yourself. The mere imparting of information is not education. The effort must result in one's ability to think and do for himself. That's what Carter G. Woodson said in The Miseducation of the Negro. And that is what we are supposed to impart and impress upon our young people, the, independent, the, uh, the ability to be intellectually autonomous, the ability to be intellectually independent, and the ability to empower others in the way that they themselves have been empowered. But it begins with us by giving them the emotional and intellectual equipment to be self-sufficient. And what they're able to do with that is up to them. We have the ability to move out the way. And that's what brings me the most gratification as the leader of this organization is the times that I'm able to move out of the way and watch them spread their wings and soar. Powerful. If I was, was at church, I would say amen. But you know, I, I think you know I resonate with most of everything you said, and and I appreciate you know you sharing that and, and being very open and personal with with those remarks as well. I want to turn now um, to follow up on that to Mr. Farmer. You know, what do you think is a benefit your generation has in this particular fight? You know, they call this generation digital, uh, you know, not of us. Well, what benefit do you think uh, that has in this particular time? So the one advantage that I think my generation has is um, our entire lives, at least I know my entire life, I have been surrounded by technology in one form or another. Um, I'm literally sitting right here with my computer right on my right side. Um, the, the benefit of that is we have access to so much information that just simply wasn't accessible prior. We are able to go on Google and search up anything that we want and get, for the most part, you know, solid answers to the questions that we have. And the disadvantage that I believe that brings is it also fills us with infinite amount of distractions, things that can sidetrack us from the reality or where we should be focused. And me as a person, I try to surround myself with multiple things, multiple viewpoints, um, ways of looking at certain issues because by understanding other people's way of thinking, I can better my own. That's my personal thought. But I'm, I realize that many of my generation are perfectly content to live within their own thoughts, to live with own, their own ways of thinking. And I think that is kind of the downfall of this generation. We are given so much access to the information, but many of us don't use, us, use it. Now, what I'm starting to see is people are waking up to that and starting to use or take advantage of that information, which you know, I'm seeing you know, people moving in a positive direction, which I appreciate, but many of us you know, still are living in that space of ignorance. That's what needs to change. That's you know, not only within the black community, within you know, all youth um, is, stopping living in our own ignorance and starting to 
you know, branch out because it's very easy to surround yourself with like-minded people or surround yourself with uh, things that you agree with, which I think needs to change. Um, now, the benefit of technology is, I'm sure all of us know that police brutality and discrimination against black people is not new. We all know that, but it's starting now that we're able to see that. We're able to see that there is a disregard, a blatant disregard for human lives. And we're waking up to that and starting to move towards change. Now, many of the things that have happened over the last 400 years simply wouldn't have happened with the access to technology we have now. Just, it wouldn't have. Because information would circulate and people would start to respond with the outrage that we're seeing now. But what we can, we can't change that. We can't change the past. We can't change the past 400 years. What, what's our responsibility to do now is to take the information that we have, see the experiences of the people around us, and then act on it and create positive change. And that's what I'm seeing currently. I like the way, I like the direction that we're moving, but at the same time, we can't stop pushing to make more change. We need to really change the way that we think, change the way that things work, and then I think we can all create the equality that we're all pushing for right now. Thank you. Thank you so much for answering and for the follow-up um, there. This uh, last segment is a little bit of fun, um, so it's for everyone on our panel tonight, including myself. Um, it's called Black Men Blank. So our series is, uh, is called Undercounted Black Men Speak under the program of Black Men Count. But I want each of you to say a verb behind black men, black men, whatever, you know, that you think addresses how you feel um, and currently represents you as a person, particularly as a black man. Um, I want to start with uh, Mr. Shankle, then go on to Mr. Thomas, Mr. Alkalik, Mr. Farmer, Mr. Wilson, Mr. Fleming, and then I'll end with myself. Um, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll just say, you know, in terms of representing what, what I've endured in sort of my life, I just say that black men overcome. And I'll try and keep it quick. I say they overcome because you look at a person like me, I grew up in one of the worst zip codes economically in Georgia. Um, you know, I'm about to go to college. Statistically, I'm supposed to be in a prison cell. So every single statistic, every single number, every single fact, every single figure from, from, from where I was born and from where I would come from tells you that I'm not supposed to be who I am right now. But I feel like black men have the endurance, the strength, um, and it's sort of the willpower to push forth and sort of beat the statistics. And now the challenge is for, 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 for the entire African-American community is to ensure that, that not just students like me overcome, but every student can overcome and every student can beat the statistics um, that can sort of cast a, a negative spell on where their life is supposed to end up. Mr. Thomas. Uh, I would I would like to say that black men ignite uh, because not only do we do we mobilize for movements like the Black Lives Matter movement and then stay complacent when we see justice in that regard, but we have things like like, like talks like these that not only talk about the issues at hand but create ways that we can you know move past and see a brighter future. So we ignite not only revolutions that brings social change, but we, we, we ignite fires and drives within ourselves to be better. So yeah, black, black men ignite, but we always come out better. Thank you, Mr. Alkali. Um, I would say that black men cultivate, not only for ourselves, but for others as well. You know, um, it, it starts at home with um, us providing for our family, us making sure to take care of our fathers and our mothers and, and, and provide for um, our siblings, but also being able to cultivate outside in the world to, to, to bring a new and bring um, from the ashes what, what, what has been um, burnt down. And um, I think that's a, a personal testament, not only for myself, but I'm sure for these um, men as well, um, being able to overcome, as Xavier said, but also um, become a new, like um, Jordan is mentioning. Thank you. Mr. Farmer. Uh, Mine is black men think. And I think that this uh, 
this forum, this panel is a perfect uh, model of that. You know? uh, we all think about the things that we're speaking about. So, you know, what's often ignored is that there are many great black minds. So black men think is what I thought of. Awesome, thank you. Mr. Wilson. I want to say that uh, Black Men Manifest, uh, you can start off with the thought, uh, as Mr. Farmer said, but I want to take it a step further to say that it's about the time that all Black men manifest uh, their intellectual property, whether it's uh, in, you know, creating an object or whether it's, you know, going to a blog and, you know, uh, writing down how they actually, actually feel. I feel like it's it's been so long that uh, people in our uh, lives as well as ourselves, you know, always speak on what we want to do, uh, what we should do, what we would do. But um, I feel like, you know, a good step would be for every black man to manifest something so that we are able to recognize uh, ourselves and others. So we can unite, so we can do things. But first step one, I feel like black man manifest. That'd be a good start. Awesome. Mr. Fleming. I would say um, hashtag black men teach. Um, when you look at any city, any state, and any country, its future is contingent upon the promise of its posterity. And because we teach, we have the confidence to step aside um, and allow the next generation to lead. And when we do that, we inevitably allow our entire community to prosper. Awesome. And so I'm going to end with what I think is the most appropriate, particularly for this particular episode for our undercounted series is Black Men Lead. You know, just listening to these young brothers on this panel um, and what they're doing in their respective, you know, communities, their neighborhoods, their schools, um, is touching to me. Um, even, you know, at my age, I won't, won't go into the age. I know uh, Mr. Fleming has already put us out there. But I think that these young brothers are leading in the way in which we're going in the right direction. And I'm, I, I feel comfortable with saying that, uh, and you know, I feel like they will be and are role models for even younger people, even younger boys right now that are growing up. And so this group is leading. I, I mean, I'd say you know, we have led in the past, we're leading and we will continue to lead. So keep up the great work. Um, you know, we look forward to continuing to work with these. That, you know, I want to continue to network with you all because I've just learned so much about you through this conversation that I think will be important as we continue many dialogues and conversations over the months to come. But thank you for tuning in uh, to tonight's uh, episode of Undercounted, Black Men Speak. Thank you to each of our panelists, you know, Mr. Fleming, Mr. Shankle, Mr. Farmer, Mr. Thomas, Mr. Alcalique, and Mr. Wilson for joining us today. We really appreciate Common Ground Foundation, really uh, appreciate the folks over at the Harvard Diversity Project for coming together to make this episode uh, possible. Thank you to those that are at home that are tuning in via Facebook Live uh, to view our discussion tonight. Uh, we hope that this has been an enlightening conversation for you as well. If we did not answer your questions in the comments on Facebook, and you know, check back, we will make sure that all of your questions are answered, particularly related to the, you know, the census. Um, we hope that you know, all of you will be able to join in next week for our final episode of this series here on uh, June 15th at 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Remember that you can fill out your census at my2020census.gov. It takes about 10 minutes. Um, so if you haven't done it, you can do it tonight before you go to bed. Um, until next time, follow Fair Count at Fair Count on Twitter and Instagram. Uh, and we look forward to seeing you next Monday. Thank you, young brothers, for joining us on this call. Um, we really appreciate it, and I guarantee it won't be the last time that we'll be conversing with you. Good night, everyone.